Welcome to Fusion. I'm Dave Weisbart, Senior Minister of the Unitarian Church in Rockford, Illinois, your host for this series. Fusion is dedicated to encouraging the exploration of questions of religious significance. It's our belief that religion is not a set of answers so much as it is a quest for greater understanding. Understanding of ourselves, of our ideals, of our communities, of our universe, most importantly, the relationship of all of these. Today in Fusion, I'd like to return to one of the greatest privileges I've had, what I consider one of the outstanding programs in our entire series, the day when we welcomed a most special guest, a woman who went by the name of Peace Pilgrim. She was a woman who in January of 1953 vowed to remain a wanderer until humanity learned the way of peace. Her original goal was to walk 25,000 miles for peace, a target that she had long since exceeded. I'd met her 13 years before and was touched by her commitment to the simple ideal of peace in the human community. When I had the opportunity to invite her to spend some time in Rockford, I leapt at it. She appeared on Fusion, on news programs, in the pulpit of the Unitarian Church, and at a variety of meetings during her stay, touching the lives of hundreds of people in a very profound way. She continued her pilgrimage, visiting in Wisconsin and then Indiana, and a month later we received word that she had been killed when a car in which she was being given a ride crashed. Today I'd like to share with you once again the opportunity to meet or to be reminded of a most powerful and gentlewoman, Peace Pilgrim. As our conversation began, I asked her where her travels had taken her. Well, this year I have covered Texas and uh, also uh, Louisiana and, of course, the rest of Illinois, too. Wow. And uh, then I'm going on to Wisconsin and then over to Michigan, Indiana, down through Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi. That will complete my year. You see, I travel with the seasons. I'm always north in the summer and south in the winter. And considering that I travel with the seasons, I can wear the same clothing indoors and out, summer and winter. My body has learned to make the necessary adjustments to changes in temperature. How, how did you begin your pilgrimage? When, when did it begin? Let's start with that. It began January 1st of 1953. It's my retirement project, and I finished counting the 25,000 miles toward the end of 1964. I have not counted miles since then. However, I will say that the real turning point in my life came 15 years prior to that, about 43 years ago. When I came out of my empty life of money and things and began to live to give instead of to get, oh, it was just the most wonderful change in my life. My life just blossomed out. I remember three things happened. I attained the great blessing of good health. You know, I haven't had an ache or a pain or a cold or a headache since. I knew my life work was going to be work for peace, not only the outer peace, but the inner peace, which I talk about the most, because that's where peace begins. It's very good to know what your life work is, because then you can get busy on it. And the third thing, long after I had finished the physical growing up and I had finished the mental growing up, I had enough knowledge to get along, I could make my own decisions, and I had finished the emotional growing up, I could get along with people and with myself. I began the spiritual growing up, which takes you from the self-centered life into the life where you see yourself in proper perspective as part of the whole and work for the good of the whole. It was doing that growing and finding inner peace that prepared me for the pilgrimage that I walk today. And when I started out, my hair had turned to silver. My friends thought I had taken leave of my senses. But I walk on that endless energy that comes with inner peace. It never runs out. And of course, a pilgrim uh, walks on faith. I have no money. I don't accept any money. I belong to no organization. There is no organizational backing behind me. And I own only uh, what I wear and just the few things I carry in my little pockets. I just walk until given shelter, fast until given food. I don't even ask. It's given without asking. Aren't people good? You know, there's a spark of good in everybody, no matter how deeply buried. It's right there. It's waiting to govern every life gloriously. In fact, and this is uh, something I would really like to emphasize, 
That spark of good is the real you. I identify with that, and I hope you do also, because when I say I, I'm not referring to the body. I'm just wearing that, nor am I referring to the self-centered nature. Now, your self-centered nature can be all mixed up and full of difficulties, but it's not the real you. I'm referring to the divine nature, the spark of good that I talked about. That is the real me, and that's what I mean when I say I. That is the real you, and that's what I see when I look at you. And that's why, to me, all people are beautiful. Now, a pilgrim walks not only prayerfully, but as an opportunity to contact people. And that's why I'm wearing my short tunic with Peace Pilgrim on the front and 25,000 miles on foot for peace on the back, because it makes my contacts for me in a very kind way. I don't need to approach people. They approach me. And my message, one sentence, this is the way of peace. Overcome evil with good and falsehood with truth, and hatred with love. You see, it isn't new, just the practice of it would be new. But I consider it the lesson for today, and it becomes, therefore, the message of my peace pilgrimage. And that's the other thing I would really like to emphasize. The basic conflict in our world today is not between nations. It is between two opposing beliefs. The belief that you can overcome evil with more evil. And of course, those people are busy multiplying the evil. Now, this is the official position of every major nation in the world. This is the war way. And the belief which is my way, and I'm sure it's your way, I'm sure many people relate to this, the belief that evil can only be overcome by good. That's the basic conflict in our world today. That really does sum it up in, in a nutshell, isn't it? That, that the government says, well, the only way we can be stronger, that we can be st secure, is if we're stronger than everybody else. And of course, if we're stronger than everybody else, then they can't be secure. And they have to build up their forces, and we have to build up our forces, and you get a spiral that just keeps building. An armaments race, yes. An armaments race, that means that, that there isn't money for the people who have the greatest need. That's so true. You see, you don't have to be good at arithmetic to figure out that if the nations of the world were to stop manufacturing implements of mass destruction, they could provide for every human being who lives in this world the basis for a very good life. And... Uh, also, I think it's becoming increasingly clear to us uh, that we are making a very momentous choice today. It's a choice between the worst that could happen, which would be a war among major nations using modern weapons, and the best that could happen, which would be if we would begin to use our resources constructively. Now, everybody is helping to make this choice. I'll tell you why. Because the trend of things, the tide of world affairs, is drifting on the downgrade. You see, we have not attained disarmament. We are sitting on a powder keg with a lighted fuse. So all who do nothing at this point in history are choosing to let things drift toward destruction. And those who want to choose peace, it's a time for action. It's a time to become a part of the stirring and awakening in the direction of peace, which has begun and is accelerating, and help to accelerate it sufficiently to turn the tide. We live at a very challenging time in human history. We're, I, 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 there's a piece of me which is skeptical about, the, about those seeds of hope that you see. I, I hope they're there. Where do you see some of those? about this gathering tide that you're talking about? When I started out, things were very different, actually. Uh, I can remember the Korean War was on at that time, January 1st of 1953, and it was the height of the McCarthy era. There was such fear at that time, and therefore great apathy, because the safest thing to do is nothing. I was speaking at a college 
and the professor had prepared a questionnaire to be answered after I spoke, and the first question was, what in our society calls forth a peace pilgrim? Because at any time in any culture where there is great apathy in the face of a crisis situation, a pilgrim is apt to step forth, and a pilgrim's job is to rouse people from their apathy and make them think. They're doing more thinking now. I'm still trying to make them think about their own potential and living according to their highest potential because those who make estimates say that we live at from 2 to 5% of our actual potential. Why, there are so many people, because we do have free will, of course, who choose not even to finish the mental and emotional growing up. And most people choose not even to begin the spiritual growing up because the beginning of it is the time when you feel completely willing without any reservations to give your life, to leave that self-centered uh, life. Now, there's a couple of other things I'd like to mention. When I started out, people accepted war as a necessary part of life. Now they're looking for alternatives to war. And this is a game. When I started out, there was very little interest in the inner search. Now there's an almost universal interest in the inner search, which to me is the greatest gain of all. Now there is darkness in our world today. It's quite natural. It's due to the disintegration of things which are contrary to the law of love. They cannot endure. They contain within themselves the seeds of their own destruction. So let us look at these things in proper perspective, and we will see that amid the darkness there is also some light. What's fascinating for me is, is the relationship that you draw between the inner life and also which is something which is obviously an outer life. As I look at some of the people who have turned to a search for, for inner peace, it's, it's been as an escape from the world. But, but your search for inner growth has led you out into the world. Oh, Can you yes. See, uh, do you, there, for some people, there's a conflict there. For you, there doesn't seem to be any at all. There is no conflict whatsoever. You see, uh, when you have found inner peace, naturally, uh, you go out into the world uh, to attempt to inspire the world to find inner peace. Now, I realize that in working for the outer peace, uh, the most valid way to work is on the inner peace, because Every human being who finds inner peace, of course, uh, will bring the world that much closer to the outer peace. In fact, you can work for peace right where you are, in your own surroundings. You can be a peacemaker, uh, uh, of course, wherever you are. And every time you succeed in bringing harmony into any inharmonious situation right where you are, you have made a contribution uh, to the total peace picture. So I would say you begin working in your own life, and when you have enough peace there, you begin working in your own surroundings. Eventually, you see, enough of us will have found enough inner peace to affect for the better our institutions. And then the better institutions will in turn, through better example, affect for the better those who are still immature. And instead of the small child watching the hero shoot the villain on some film, which trains the little child to believe that shooting people is heroic, the hero just did it, effective, it seemed to work, acceptable, he was well thought of afterward, the little child will see the hero do something significant to help people, a different hero image. So you so see... It would be different, yes. Yes, uh, you keep on working in any way that you can for peace. Can it, it would help to understand your pilgrimage, pilgrimage a little bit more if you would say something about how you got in, what led you to start it? Well, after I had found inner peace, you might just say a thought struck my mind. I felt this strong inner motivation. What were you doing at the time? What I was working with people who had problems. I am very good at working with people who have problems because I know we live in a very orderly universe. If you have a problem, 
with a proper attitude, you can not only solve that problem, but you can learn and grow through solving it. Problems are really wonderful learning and growing experiences. And that applies not only to personal problems, but also to collective problems. If you see, uh, we would solve our collective problems, we would discover that we had done a great deal of learning and growing. Now, uh, I therefore uh, was able, of course, uh, to inspire many people toward a proper attitude uh, for their problems and uh, to inspire them toward a good lifestyle. You know, if you're the breadwinner, you would need to have a useful task in society that would provide remuneration. And most people are called into the family pattern by this thing referred to as falling in love. And then, of course, they would act as a family unit. And that would go into their lifestyle. That is not in my lifestyle. You see, I could never have left anyone who might worry about me or depend upon me to walk a pilgrimage. And so my entire life prepared me and kept me free of all close ties. Mm -hmm. Although I do feel that all human beings are my beautiful kinfolk. I love them all. Then uh, there are three other things. You could divide them into three. Uh, one of them is sensible living habits, sensible eating, rest, exercise, and especially sensible thinking because you can absolutely destroy yourself through negative thinking. Every moment of your life you're creating through thought. I'm always thinking about the best that could happen, the good things I'd like to see happen, solutions to problems. And if someone does a mean thing to me, I just feel the deepest compassion for that out of harmony person who is hurt by having done a mean thing. I don't hurt myself by a wrong reaction of bitterness or anger. So I tell people I practice prevention. I don't eat junk food and I don't think junk thoughts. And then you need to have in your life something inspirational, something that will lift you up and inspire you and awaken that higher nature uh, within you. Now, I believe, of course, that that's one of the functions, certainly, of a church service, mm -hmm. to lift you up and inspire you, and of the arts and so on. Now, you also need a path of service, something you do to help somebody, because in this world you're given as you give. And so, you see, I used to also inspire them toward a, a good uh, lifestyle. Okay, so, so then finding this piece, see what, what we're talking about partly is, is, is one of the things that I see as a fundamental religious concern, is that people sometimes use religion and, and say, well, what I will do is find inner harmony, and then after I've accomplished all of that, I will go outside. But you're saying now that, that part of how that inner harmony comes is by reaching out in service right along, <laughs> that you aren't going to find it inside until you're also reaching outside. That is correct, you okay, see. That... Nobody finds inner peace except one who has done a lot of giving. I dedicated 15 years of my life to just solid giving before I had found inner peace. It was a beautiful uh, growth pattern, and that was the time, of course, that I was working with those people who had problems. And just as uh, we, I hope, enjoy our other growth patterns, the physical uh, growing and the mental growing and so forth, uh, we should also enjoy uh, the spiritual growing. I did. In other words, my life became better and better. But this is the best of all, and I believe retirement years should be the best of all. And so, so you had just an incredible number of new experiences every day. Of course. Since your retirement. Oh, yes, I think I Supposed learned something retirement. every day. I, which, <laughs> well, which is the retirement? I'm not, I mean, it seems like in some ways well, you began living a whole life at the point that you stopped working in that other framework. I, what the world would call retirement okay. time, you see. Uh, but uh, yes, it's it's been the most active time of my life. And it should be uh, so, actually. And uh, of course, in this uh, time of my life, I'm still, in a sense, working with people who have problems. Only now I talk to them in groups about solutions to problems rather than uh, working with them individually. And every pr experience that comes to me, I have discovered, is a worthwhile experience in my life. It either teaches me something, or inspires me, or gives me a chance somehow to be of service. Have you been in this area before? 
Oh, yes. In, in Rockford? Oh, yes. And because what I noticed was after we, our church newsletter mentioned that you were coming, and I started getting phone calls from people in the TV stations and the radio stations that we heard Peace Pilgrim is coming. I can't figure out how so many people had heard about you. Uh, you must have an awful lot of people around this country who know you were around. <laughs> There's about 10,000 on the mailing list. And, of course, they're notified uh, when I'm coming into ah. an area. And uh, I was here about five years ago. Oh. This is my seventh pilgrimage route, or my seventh uh, pilgrimage across the country. And uh, I um, have covered the 50 states, the 10 Canadian provinces, parts of Mexico. Yes, I got to the 49th and the 50th state. You oh, didn't walk to Hawaii, though. Oh, I'm not quite up to that <laughs> yet. Maybe in a little while, but not quite now. It requires a little more growing. But a wealthy man heard me speak, and he wanted his relations in Alaska and Hawaii to hear me, so he took me. That's how I got there in 1975. Mm -hmm. And now that I've been there, I can lead tours there. So I led a tour to Alaska uh, the summer before last, last summer to Hawaii, and and I will lead tours to Alaska and Hawaii again in 1984. It's just a beautiful retreat situation. We're together for a couple of weeks amid beautiful surroundings, and everybody comes back inspired and uplifted, everyone ready to work for their good cause. <laughs> but but it, it literally, you know, I think people may wonder about uh, it, what kind of organization? As you said before, there is no organization. No. The only organization is in your head. <laughs> I mean, your mailing list and, and your sense of who these people are. But there are no underwriters. There's no money involved in your coming to an area. There are no collections at any of your appearances. You, you strictly and literally work on the basis that you stay where, where you're invited to stay and are fed when you're invited to eat. Yes, and it has to be offered. I don't even ask. Yeah. Uh, you see, um, I... It is quite true, go according to invitation now, but even when I was completely on my own, starting out as a penniless pilgrim, absolutely unknown, uh, even then I was offered shelter by total strangers about three quarters of the time and seldom skipped more than maybe uh, three or four meals in a row. People are good. Now, some people have offered to help me. It's not an organization, but a lady offered to forward my mail, and I'm yeah. very grateful. And then there are three ladies offered to get out some literature for me if I would write it, and I'm very grateful for that. But you see, it's set up so that if I had to operate alone, I, I could operate mm -hmm. alone. The post office would forward my mail. I, I got a letter about a year and a half ago from somebody in California who I don't even know said, notice that you have a Unitarian church in Rockford. Would you like to have Peace Pilgrim come sometime? And oh, I wrote yes. back and, and <laughs> wrote, they gave me your address and I wrote and said, happy to have you come. And then we've been corresponding for a number of months and here you are. So <laughs> well, it happens relatively informally, really. Yes. You see, uh, sometimes people think that uh, the church of their denomination should be notified of my right, coming. Right. And actually, the lady is a Quaker, uh, but uh, she's offered to send out letters also for this college professor who is a Unitarian. Ah, he wrote so the letter, you see. <laughs> I got in, in California, right? Uh, yes. Right. So, what you ha have you had any experiences which, which have made you wonder about people, or do you always get treated hospitably? Oh, people are good. I have no doubt of that. Uh, I have to uh, really think back to my tests if I want to tell you anything that might be considered an adverse experience. And I don't consider it an adverse experience. Life is a series of tests. But if you pass your test, you look back upon it as a good experience. I was hit once in my first test by a disturbed teenage boy who was terrified by a thunder shower. I had taken him for a walk. I thought it would do him good. And he went off the beam when that thunder shower came along, and he came for me. And I didn't even try to run away, which I guess I could have done. He had a heavy pack on his back. And even while he began to hit me, I could only feel the deepest compassion for him. How terrible to be so psychologically sick that you would be able to hit an old woman. I faced his hatred with love even while he hit me. And as a result, it reached that spark of good in him. All was there, no matter how deeply buried. And he experienced remorse. And to make a long story short, 
What are a few bruises on my body in comparison with the transformation of a human life? He never was violent again. He's a useful person in this world today. Now, one more, and that is the time I had to defend the frail little eight-year-old girl against a large man who was about to beat her, and the girl was terrified. Well, I knew her danger because of her fear. You attract what you fear. So I put my body between the man and the girl, and I just stood and looked at that poor, psychologically sick man with loving compassion. He came close. He stopped. He looked at me for quite a while, he turned around, walked away, and the girl was safe. Now, what was the alternative? Suppose I had been so foolish as to attempt to use the jungle law of tooth and claw. I would undoubtedly be dead today, and so would the little girl. Let us never underestimate the great power of the way of love, which reaches that spark of good in the other person, and the person is disarmed. Today, we've had the opportunity to experience once again the presence of one of the most remarkable persons that I've ever met, Peace Pilgrim, who visited us in 1981, just before her death. During Peace Pilgrim's visit, I had the opportunity to accompany her and to observe her in a variety of situations. There were several people who expressed the initial impression that she couldn't possibly be real. She was, in a sense, larger than life. Peace Pilgrim had an incredible power about her person, and I came to the conclusion that her power came from the fact that she was in fact, most real. She was a living demonstration of the potential that can be unleashed when persons are fully engaged in doing what they believe to be the most important thing in the world. It was impossible to learn the particulars about the person, her name, her age, her background. She was known by us only as Peace Pilgrim and insisted that she had stopped counting her birthdays long ago and that when she did, she'd stop feeling older every year. The report of her death gave her given name and her age, but they were erased from my memory because they simply were not relevant. What was important about Peace Pilgrim was the message that she shared in her inexhaustible way and the power of her presence. I treasure the opportunity to have met and to have been touched by her as I hope that you have.